Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of This Week in the XFL. I'm your host, as always, the referee representing XFL Newsroom, ooh, the number one source in XFL News. We have a lot of things to talk about this week. I don't want to say it's a huge week. I say it every week, but you know what? It's a little bit of a huge news week. But before we get started, I just wanted to remind everybody we have a giveaway going on. You can win two tickets to any XFL game this season. All you gotta do is like, comment, subscribe, and click the link down in the description for the Discord. Get up to at least a rookie status. It's only about 50 or 60 posts, but the good news is you'll be hanging out with a bunch of other like-minded XFL fans just like you and me. When are you gonna find out if you're gonna win? Well, we're gonna tell you. So next Friday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central, we're doing our next XFL Newsroom Live YouTube special. We got me, the referee. We got the XFL delivery guy. We got Tron Hawkins from This Is The XFL Podcast and Jay Dash from XFL Unhinged. So get signed up. We're gonna announce the winners during that live stream so you won't wanna miss it. But hey, let's get to the news. We are just a week away from when the XFL kicks off. I know I said this last week when we were two weeks away, but I never thought we'd get to this point. It feels like an eternity. We've been doing this for over a year, and you know what? It just keeps getting more and more exciting. I'm gonna be sad when the season's over, but the good news, the season is just beginning. So we're gonna start out with a little bit of news that came after the cuts occurred, and we'll talk about that a little bit later with the final rosters. But people have wondered, what's going on with Team 9? So after the cuts had been uh, announced, or really the rosters had been announced, Bart Andrus was named the head coach of Team 9. So Team 9, if you're not aware, is going to be based out in Dallas. It's going to be basically the practice squad for the rest of the XFL. So if there's an injury, they will be able to supplement all eight teams in the league throughout Team 9. We're going to have about 35 to 40 players. that are going to, They're going to be dressing up every day, practicing just like they were on one of these other eight teams. I think it's awesome. And you know what? They got a guy with a little bit of experience from everything. So this guy's worked in NFL Europe, CFL, UFL. He has some college experience, and I think he's going to be great for this job. So I don't know. Let us know what you think down in the comments below. It's exciting to finally get some news on Team 9. Like we said, this guy's been all over the place. He's coached for the Argonauts. He coached in the UFL, and he coached in college. I... I uh, I think this is perfect, especially when you look at that NFL Europe experience. This is something NFL Europe had as well. They had that supplemental team. They had a team nine, if you will, that they use for these same reasons. So he may be able to give a little bit of input in that direction there. Although he didn't coach that team nine in NFL Europe, the experience is going to be good for them regardless. Overall, like I said, it's just exciting to be getting some Team 9 news, regardless of how big or small it is. And I'm sure we'll see the rosters for that soon. There were some surprising cuts that came out of these roster announcements. So we're moving on over to the Northwest for Seattle. So people have been wondering, how are the ticket sales going in the XFL? And overall, they seem to be doing pretty well, at least for a first year league, they're doing better than the AAF from what we can tell. Again, there's no official numbers out there, but if you go on Ticketmaster.com, you can look at each of the games and see what seats are still there, which ones are still available. Well, we have some news on who's leading the ticket sales, and at least according to NBC Sports, that is the Seattle Dragons. And quite honestly, it's no surprise to me. You can see them getting fired up, if you will, online. They're breathing fire. They're getting hyped for that season. When you look back a little bit ago when they had their training camp and their mini camp rather up in Seattle, over a thousand people showed up just for the mini camp. 
People love their sports in Seattle. So the article goes on to say, at least from NBC Sports, that once the Seahawks lost to the Packers in the playoffs, the tickets started to surge even more for the Dragons. So they're expecting about 20,000 people there, at least for that first game. And that's huge. Now it's not gonna fill up all of CenturyLink, but we know that the XFL is really only targeting those lower bowls in those bigger stadiums. I think it's gonna be rocking in Seattle. I'm excited. You know, they're on the road for the first week. A week from now, they're gonna be in DC, but it's not gonna to be too long until we see them in their full glory with, you know, the fans making it live there in Seattle. And again, speaking of Seattle, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned it on this show, but we have Tron Hawkins from This Is The XFL Podcast coming out to Houston when they're taking on the Dragons. We're gonna be doing a live edition of This Is The XFL Podcast during the tailgate of the Roughnecks game, Roughnecks and Dragons game rather. So again, click the link down in the description for the Roughnecks tailgate group. That's where we're gonna be hanging out. We're gonna be having fun at all the home games this season and especially that one. So get signed up. Like I said, a week away, it's getting exciting. But if you're in the Dallas area, I have some cool news for you. So tomorrow, at least the time, at the time that this is published, so Saturday, February 1st, the Dallas Renegades are holding an open house. So this is your chance to go see the team's practice prior to them kicking off a week from now. Plus, you'll get to check out that new stadium, get to check out the new field. There's gonna be some meet and greets. It's gonna be great for all ages. If I was a little bit closer, I'd be heading up there. I'm hoping we get some events in Houston before it finally kicks off. But you know what? Like I said, we're getting to the fun part of the air, uh, the fun part of the year, right? We have the Super Bowl, then we have the XFL, and at least in my opinion, I am much more hyped for the XFL kickoff than I am for the Super Bowl this year. But if you're in that Dallas area, we strongly suggest that you check it out. These events are a great way to learn about the XFL from the people building it from the ground up. We've attended all the events in Houston. You should definitely check this one out in Dallas. It's going to be a good time. And like I said, it's just one extra opportunity to see your XFL team on the field before they officially kick off in a week. Big news if you ask me. So we're moving on to some officiating news. So as you know, Dean Blandino, he's come into the league as the head of officiating. And he's been working with the league for a while now, almost a year probably. Uh, we didn't know what his official role was gonna be, but he's, he's been affiliated with the XFL, at least in advising roles and things of that nature. And he had an interview a while back and he said that when it comes to the XFL, they want to have a very progressive and diverse officiating staff. And it looks like he's a man of his word. So it's just come out via footballzebras.com that the XFL will have at least one woman on all of its officiating teams. So when you look back at the AAF, they also tried to lead the charge there. They had three females on that officiating staff while well, the XFL is essentially, essentially doubling that with six. So we have the whole breakdown here. And what you'll notice is we do have some officials with some good experience here. So we have Maya Chalky, the line judge. We have Lachelle Nelson as the side judge. She refs in Conference USA. Robin DiLorenzo's line judge. Amanda Sourcook, center judge from the Big Ten Conference. Now we're talking some legit experience here. The Big Ten is nothing to mess with. Connor Cook will tell you that. Houston Roughneck, sign him up. Uh, we also have Sabrina Brunson, field judge. Tangela Mitchell, headline judge, Southwestern Atlantic Conference. And here's a big one. Terry Valenti will be sitting in that replay booth. Uh, she's a replay official for the NFL, and she's gonna be sitting in the replay booth for the XFL. So we're getting some qualified folks here with a little bit of diversity. The XFL is coming out strong, right? When you look back at when Vince McMahon first announced the XFL, a lot of people scoffed at it and say, oh, this is just gonna be the Trump League. There's no kneelers. And 
from everything that we're seeing out of the XFL, it's, it's almost the exact opposite. Whether you like that or you don't, we're seeing smart moves made by the right people in the right positions, like I said, with those right decisions, bringing in, starting it out the right way. You know, again, touching on the diversity, we have the, a very high percentage in the coaching range with diversity. We have more diversity in the XFL than we do the NFL, and now that springs down to the officials. Again, let us know what you think down below. A lot of people don't like the officials in the NFL. There's one thing you gotta admit with the XFL, they're trying things out a little bit differently. We're getting excited, like I said, but we do need to move to, you know, a little bit of a sad story here. So it wasn't too long ago that we learned that Garrett Hartley had signed with the Seattle Dragons. So they had worked, Cole Tracy, he even worked in that preseason game. But Garrett Hartley had made the team but this work week, we, we got some unfortunate news. He's, he's been cut from the team and he had a very emotional message that he put out on Instagram and later Twitter. And basically it stems down to a past injury that he had. He's been cleared by his doctors, but the XFL staff or the XFL doctors have not cleared him. It's just too much of an unknown risk for, for the league. Um, and you know, it's, it's really a hard one to say, right? So one of the things that the XFL has been talking about, wow, for almost a year now is that player safety, right? They, they've brought in people to assess concussions and ways to make the plays safer, the players safer. So it's hard to argue with them when they cut them over this injury now. I would expect to see him land on his feet somewhere, right? If his doctors cleared him, Maybe they'll reassess him down the line. Maybe he gets back in the NFL. But this is a really, this is a tough one, not only for Garrett, but for the Dragons, right? So when this came out, there was only 10 days left until the season. Now we're a week and there's still no official kicker for the team. They did bring in former San Diego kicker, Donnie Heigman for a tryout. There's still an no announcement if he's been chosen for the job. You know, another thing, they could bring Cole Tracy back, but again, he might not want to come back. Either way, this is a bad situation, however you look at it, both from, you know, Garrett's side mostly. He did not, he was not happy about this, right? He's losing his dream, essentially, but also from the Dragons, right? We're, we're a week out from kickoff and they're minor, minus, uh, uh, um, really kind of a major player for the team. It, although kicks aren't as important in the XFL, those field goals will be. Trust me. Trust me on this. So, you know, that's that's really unfortunate. We're going to we're going to use this somber time to move into another unfortunate story. So, we're moving down here to the southeast with Tampa Bay over with the Vipers. So, all in all, their big highlight of that team other than maybe Aaron Murray was the recent signing of Antonio Callaway. And you know, it's really unfortunate that these things happen, but he was injured during the, the practice this week, right? So although the training camps are over, the teams are all still practicing. They're getting ready for this upcoming season. And it looks like the Vipers are out their star player. Um, it, not, right now, they haven't really said how, how severe the injury is, but Tressman did comment on the situation saying that it's a lower leg injury there have been reports that he was carted off the field so if that is the situation this might not be very good and this and again this is very unfortunate he was using this opportunity to really show that he he meant he meant that he wanted to play football right he's recently been suspended from the cleveland browns he came into the xfl to kind of prove himself and he may need to wait a little bit longer to have that opportunity, which like I said, is very unfortunate. I don't like to see these guys getting injured. I don't like to get, see guys get cut even when they're not injured, but in this instance, it makes it a little bit worse. Overall, you know, let us know down in the comments below. Are you a Dragons fan? Are you a Vipers fan? How do you think this will impact your team? 
because like I said, we're a week out and these are kind of, at least on the, on the Viper side, this was a major element of that team, the major chemistry that they were gonna use to possibly win some games here. He was going to be the receiver that Aaron Murray needed to make those completions. So, I, I, you know, it's not looking too good for the Vipers. They didn't, you know, they didn't pull it out in the preseason. Now one of their major stars is injured. Like I said, we'll keep you updated. So check out xflnewsroom.com daily for all the latest news. Once we learn more on this subject, we'll, we'll let you know. But hopefully both of these guys get well, well, at least Garrett is well, but hopefully he gets an opportunity. Hopefully Callaway gets well soon, gets, gets back on his feet and gets back in the game. Because like I said, this is something you never want to see. So like we've probably mentioned a million times during this episode, we only have one week left until the XFL kicks off. So we wanted to give you an early weather report for the folks that plan on attending the games. So like I said, th these are the early games in the season. These are the ones where it might be a little bit chilly in some of these areas. You might get some of that rougher weather. So we wanted to keep you posted. We'll keep you posted again next week, the day before everything kicks off. But we did want to give you that early weather report just to get you uh, maybe a little bit more prepared for these upcoming games. I know I'm ready to hit up that tailgate in Houston. So the first game, we're kicking it off in DC. And originally, if you saw our post on XFL Newsroom, it wasn't too bad, but there was chances of snow. Well, that's completely gone away. We're looking at a high of 52, low of 39. And quite honestly, for this time of the year in DC, I think that's gonna be perfect football weather. But then we're moving over to Houston, which again, arguably has the best weather of the day and of the two day stretch of the weekend, if you will. High of 73, low of 58, partly cloudy, no chance of rain. I'm extra excited now to hit up that tailgate, uh, the tailgate over at the Houston Roughnecks party. So moving on to Sunday, we have Dallas, a little bit cooler, but not too bad. High is 65, low 46. So Globe Life, I think, is going to be looking pretty good that opening day. Now, probably the scariest one of them all, but it did get better. There was chances of snow and rain, and that seems to have dissipated. But we're looking at a high of 49, low of 35. But like I said, for this time of year, that's not too bad. You might want to bundle up a little bit. Get your uh, Guardians hoodie, get your Guardians jacket if you have one, maybe a scarf and a beanie cap or something to stay a little bit warm. But I think we could be doing a lot worse for this time of the year. Like I said, I'm excited to be tailgating one week from now over at TDECU Stadium. So if you're there and you see us, say hello. We always love talking to the fans. We're having a good time here. So speaking of Houston, we have a little bit of news for you. So the Roughnecks have announced their official radio partner. So a few weeks ago, we sp spoke about John Granado joining on to become the official radio voice of the Roughnecks. Well, now the, uh, the news is official. ESPN 95.7 is the official radio partner of the Houston Roughnecks. They're gonna be covering all the games, including a pre and a post game show. I'm excited there, right? We're getting extra content. I'll be checking that out in the tailgate. I might even tune in, in, tune in during the games. Hopefully there's not too much of a delay, but it's always fun. I'm excited to see these announcements come out. So again, 97.5 ESPN. If you're in Houston, that's where you can check out all the Roughnecks games on the radio. So actually the day later we learned about the Seattle Dragons radio partner. So 710 AM ESPN. That's gonna be your official spot for the Dragons. So beyond the games, they got a couple extra special things going on. So they got general manager and head coach Jim Zorn. He's gonna be working with them on a weekly basis for some extra shows that aren't even affiliated with the games at all. So we're getting some extra weekly talk shows. We're getting some spots with the coaches. We're getting the game coverage, pre and post game shows. So if you're in Seattle, I'm a little bit jealous. I kind of wish we got a little bit of that here. But the good thing is we have the internet nowadays, so there is gonna be a way to check it out. So it's awesome to see. I, I assume by this time next week, we'll probably have the rest of the radio partners. So stay tuned for this week in the XFL. We'll keep you posted as we learn more. Overall, 
right, it seems like we're gonna get ESPN as the official radio partner for all of these teams, which is good news, right? Because again, on the radio, you want that legit partner. But again, from the TV standpoint, we have legit partners as well with Fox, ESPN, Fox Sports 1, and ABC. So it's gonna be easy to find these games, whether you're watching on TV, if you live in the area and you wanna go to the game, or if you're just listening on the radio. So, the big news has happened, right? The rosters have been released. The preseason is over. The training camps are over. The mini camps are over. We have the summer showcase. We got the team identities, the game balls, the jerseys. But you know what we have now? We have the official 52-man rosters for all the XFL teams. So what we wanted to do here is kind of rank our teams just based on a couple factors. Not just the rosters, but kind of what we saw at that preseason. Uh, now, I did listen to Tron Hawkins' episode on This Is The XFL Podcast. We'll have a link up here. You should check his rankings out as well. So I tried to make sure they were a little bit different, but I, I got to say I do agree with his assessments. But we're going to give our thoughts, our opinions, go through our list. We changed it up just a little bit. And we're going to give you our reasonings why on some of these as well. So we're going to go from worst to first, baby. So number eight, I don't think there's going to be a lot of denying this, at least right now, because I'm going to preface a lot of these with some arguments. But coming in last place is the Tampa Bay Vipers. Now, first and foremost, there's a couple factors in this. One, they lost by the most amount of points and they had the least amount of points in the preseason. They, they looked like they were struggling to get into that game a little bit. Now, I do want to say that was only preseason, and since there was only one week of preseason for the XFL, it was very similar to the fourth week of the NFL preseason. So, and considering the fact that they're playing their week one opponents, in all reality, these coaches weren't using their best plays, their best schemes, and in instances were swapping players out like they probably wouldn't normally do. But that being said, that's just one factor to this. The other one, like we mentioned earlier in this episode, is Antonio Callaway getting injured. Until we know how severe that injury is, and until we see how this team plays on the field, it's gonna be hard for me to move them out of this eighth position. But again, we could be surprised. I think there's a lot of potential out of the Vipers, and I think they're gonna surprise a lot of people. Now, I don't necessarily agree with this, but the Caesars lines came out and they have the Vipers set to win the championship with eight wins on the season. Now, again, if you're in Vegas, I would bet the under on that if you can, because I don't think they're gonna get eight wins this season, but I don't think they're gonna lose eight games this season as well. Look at their coaching staff. Mark Trestman, only back-to-back -back championship coach in CFL. They have Jerry Glanville. They have basically CFL South down in Tampa Bay. So we're gonna see a different style of play. They have, they have some good players. Aaron Murray's gonna be pretty top notch. Quinton Flowers is another one that is kind of that dual threat quarterback and running back, right? So I think we're gonna see a lot of surprise plays. We're gonna see maybe some surprise wins out of this team. But as of right now, that's who's sitting at number eight. Now, number seven, this is where I think a lot of people are gonna start getting angry with my list. But again, this is just week one power rankings, ranking these teams based on what we've seen in the preseason, what we see in their rosters, and kind of what we've seen so far. So this will, will definitely change week one. I don't think I'm gonna predict all of these, but next week we'll have some picks, but we're not doing picks just yet. But we have the Seattle Dragons, right? So in Seattle, you have Brandon Silvers and BJ Daniels. Brandon Sil Silvers has been named the starter. And you know, one aspect to look at with the XFL, this is something I've been telling people at least, is I think to be successful in this league, you need two at least decent quarterbacks on your team. I think having two halfway decent quarterbacks is gonna be better than having one really good quarterback in a lot of instances. And with these guys, Brandon Silvers is more than a halfway decent quarterback. He did some good things in the Alliance. He kind of proved himself there 
And I think he's going to have an opportunity to prove himself here. But again, looking just looking at the preseason, the scores, kind of going into the league, there's a couple things we got to talk about. Very similar to what we just said in that first with the Vipers, you know, the Dragons are out of kicker, right? They're, they're down one player with a week to go. Granted, it's not the most important player on the team, but those three points are going to matter when you need them, right? Especially in that first week. So we're keeping them at seven here. And another one really is they were the second lowest scoring team in that preseason. They struggled a little bit in the game. Again, this is just preseason. I don't want to bring it up too much, but this is why we're sitting at number seven. They could absolutely win that opening game in D.C. And we'll get to them here in a little bit. But we're moving num to number six here. And this is probably sure to rile a, cu a couple feathers. No pun intended. We have the St. Louis Battlehawks. I think this team has a lot of promise, but here's, here are the things that I'm looking at. Is one, things were a little slow in that game that they played against Dallas in the preseason. But beyond that, so they've named Jordan Te'amu as their starter, which I think he's gonna be awesome, but he is the youngest starting quarterback in the XFL, so he doesn't have as much experience as some of these other guys. Same with the coaching staff. We have Coach Hayes who, again, I think is going to do some really exciting things just because he doesn't have the same experience. He's more willing to try out some of these new things. But I think that until we see this team hit the field, those are going to be some notches against them. Now I'll say this, they do have a very strong defense. We have a couple good guys here. Uh, their running game, they got Christine Michael. So that's why they're moving up to that, you know, number six spot. This could absolutely change. We'll see. This is just week one power rankings. We're moving to number five, though. DC Defenders, right? So we have two of these teams already that are going to match up in this lower half of the list. And again, Cardale Jones, I think, is going to be awesome. But, you know, Tron Hawkins brought this up on This is the XFL podcast. Has he really proven himself? He's had one really good year in college with Ohio State, but he hasn't really done much after that. He's floated around with some practice squads. He's ultimately made it to the XFL. But I think this is why this league is important. This is giving him that opportunity to prove himself, to show the naysayers. But he did have a couple picks in that preseason game. Again, they weren't working with their top guys, but there were some that did seem a little bit inexcusable, but they do have some star players on that team. Not to say that Cardale's not a star, but he has some guys that he'll be able to work with. Rashad Ross, Simi Cobbs, those are guys that are gonna be very impactful on the field. I expect to see their names a lot come this season. And overall, sitting at that five spot, it's not too bad, not too horrible, but we'll see. Will they move up? Will they move down? Those are the reasons why I'm putting them there. But then we're moving to number four here, Dallas Renegades. Now, very similar to what I was saying with the Battlehawks here, I expected them to come out a lot stronger than they did. But the factors to keep in mind here, like the first two teams we talked about, is that injury bug. So Landry Jones, he technically is still injured right now. He's slated to miss maybe that first or second week. They do have Eric Dungy, which is a solid quarterback but that's not the star that they were practicing with and hoping for once opening day came. Now there are some reports that he might be ready for week one, but those really aren't official yet. We'll have to see how practices go with the team. Like I said, we have that open house on Saturday. So hopefully we'll have some reports. If, if Landry Jones is out there practicing, you know what? This team might move up a couple notches in these rankings and he might be ready to play that week one. Overall, though, they have a pretty good running game. They have some great receivers, Jazz Ferguson, Jeff Bidette. They're doing some really cool things over in Dallas. I, Like I said, they're at that top tier of this list here. So you know what? I think they're going to be pretty solid. We'll have to see, though. But, you know, moving on to the next one here. Now, this one's a tie for number two or three, however you want to position that. We'll start off with the first one. Now, actually, I'll tell you right here. These two teams played each other in the preseason. They're playing each other in the first week and it's none other than the Los Angeles Wildcats. 
and my home team, the Houston Roughnecks. Now you would say, well, hold on. The Roughnecks gave up a huge lead in that game. Now, and I would counter that argument with this. It won, it's, this was the best tale of two halves game in this preseason. And when I want to look at a game to gauge a team, especially in the preseason, I'm mainly going to focus on that first half. And the Roughnecks came out strong. The Wildcats struggled a little bit, but that second half, they came out real strong. Now, I think some people might be surprised that the Wildcats are so high on this list. Now, I'll tell you this, Tron Hawkins put him at number one. Yeah, the Wildcats at number one. And I'm going to repeat some of the things that he said here. So one, he made a killer deal with that Luis Perez trade. Now, there were some people angry online, and the coach came out and said, look, hold on here. Just watch this guy that we got. And Chad Canoff, he threw for three touchdowns in that preseason game. Now they have two solid quarterbacks in LA, right? So they have Josh Johnson, Chad Canoff, both looking pretty good in that preseason game. And now this one, and Tron was loving it. I'm loving it, and I'm sure all the Wildcats fans are loving it as well. Sean Oakman is back on the team. So he was cut way early in the training camp. There were some reports that maybe it had to do with some off the field stuff, some maybe bad attitudes, or it was a trick. Nobody picked him up. Coach Moss said, you know what, sign us up. We're bringing him back on the team. Dude, their defense is stacked now. So I'm curious to see what this week one against the Roughnecks looks like now because the preseason's totally different because they have some different players. They have a strong player on defense there. And they're a pretty stacked team as well, right? But the defense is looking pretty, pretty good. The offense was looking good. But again, like we said, we're tied here with the Roughnecks. Now, this goes back to the point I was making earlier about dual threats at quarterback. I think if you have two decent quarterbacks in this league, it's better than have one, having one really good quarterback. And we have P.J. Walker and Connor Cook for Houston. And both of them were looking really solid throughout practice, the training camp, and the preseason. And quite honestly, I think we're going to see a healthy dose of both of these quarterbacks throughout the season. Now, there may technically be a starter, whether it be Connor Cook or P.J. Walker, but I think we're going to see Coach June Jones swap these players out quite a bit, even throughout one game. Right? Coach June Jones is a mastermind. Some people don't give him the credit he deserves. But the, the Roughnecks are going to be trying to score as many points as possible. And that's what June Jones loves. I expect to see three-point conversions, two-point conversions, but not a lot of one-point conversions after the touchdowns. I expect to see a lot of passing. And we have a lot of guys that you can throw that ball to. Khalil Lewis, Sam Mobley, Sammy Coates. Multiple threats at quarterback, multiple threats at wide receiver, and not to mention Andre Williams at running back. This team is looking stacked. Now again, you could say they gave up that lead in the preseason game, but again, my argument would be is they had the people that they were really trying to assess in that second half of the game. This is gonna be a team that's not scared to score points. So we have a first week matchup tied for number two, LA and Houston. So we're moving on to number one. And I think this one might surprise a lot of people. You probably figured it out right now. But we have Kevin Gilbride and the New York Guardians. So we, again, dual threat quarterback combo, Matt McGloin. Luis Perez working with the quarterback whisperer, Kevin Gilbride. They scored the most points of any team in the preseason and held the other team to the lowest amount of points. Strong offense, strong defense. And if you can have a strong defense in this league, that's gonna go a long way because a lot of these teams are gonna have very strong offenses. We'll see how their defenses shake out. But what we're seeing with the Guardians here is we're seeing the birth of a very convincing team. 
They moved up a lot in my list just by watching the training camp, watching the moves that they're making. Things are looking good for them. Like I said, dual quarterback combo, threats at the receivers, Mikhail McKay, Colby P Pearson, Tio Redding, which is going to be a name you're going to be hearing a lot of this season. And their running game isn't too shabby. Tim Cook, running back, going to do it up for him. So let us know your thoughts. Do you agree with these rankings? I know there's going to be some people that don't. There might be some people that do. Let us know your rankings down below. Or if you're feeling like having a good time, click the link in the description for the Discord. Come join us. We'll talk about our rankings there. So that was about it for this week. Uh, but there is one, one last topic that we do want to talk about. We've had a few sad topics in this episode, but none as sad as the one that we're going to talk about here. So as you should know by now, Kobe Bryant has passed away. He, uh, he was in a helicopter accident earlier this week on Sunday, traveling to, uh, coach, uh, to coach a youth basketball game with his daughter and a few other players and a few other people. Nobody survived. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say this, you know, I'm a, I, I grew up a Pistons fan, so I was never, never a Lakers fan. I probably always rooted against Kobe in every game that we played against him. Uh, but as a sports fan, you always recognize the great players. Uh, even if you root against them, similar with the, you know, Peyton Manning, uh, Tom Brady, uh, not necessarily their fans. I don't root for them, but you respect their greatness. Uh, and Kobe Bryant is one of those players, one of the greatest, if not the greatest player in the NBA, in basketball history. Uh, and it's, it really kind of, it, it brings you down to earth a little bit. We were at the Royal Rumble. Uh, it was here in Houston and we were at the bar watching um, just ESPN when the news came on. And, you know, it really hit us hard. It hit my wife extra hard. So her and her brother grew up Lakers fan, Kobe Bryant was the main reason that they got into basketball. They both played, they both coached. And, uh, you know, she, she's really broken up by this. And it, like, like Tron said on his podcast, um, you know, if you're, if you're arguing with anybody in your family, get, you know, get it over with. Life is short. You never know when it's going to end. You never know the circumstances. So hug the, hug the people you love. Let them know that you love them. Um, we're not even going to shill our stuff at the end, but you know, rest in peace, Kobe, everybody else that passed away on the flight. We'll see you next week on this week in the XFL.